Thank you very much. Now, um, can we get uh, some of the diasporans, the chairman, Nido Americas, Obed, are you there? I'll hand over to Obina to get the people that will be just saying, making a few remarks. And if there's any more to add, I think you've virtually um, answered all the questions. So, Obina, can I... you... Obina. Yes, can we have Mr. Obed, Mr. Yes, Lewis? They're coming, they're coming on right now. Please make it very brief. Gentlemen, please, please proceed. And uh, um, Mr. Lewis, please go ahead. Please unmute. Good evening, everyone. Uh, may I say thank you uh, to Dr. Sania Liu and a big thank you to Honorable Abike Dabri Rewa, the Chairman CEO of NITCOM. Um, we know that I'm Bolaji Lewis, Mobolaji Lewis, and I'm the Chairman of Nigerian Think Tank Group worldwide and uh, a committee member of the NDIS 2020 uh, that's uh, Nigerian Diaspora uh, Investment Summit. Um, we actually appreciate all the things that uh, PTF has been doing. In fact, one of the things we looked at and which you have pointed out is the fact that um, the challenge is balancing uh, public health against a uh, private pursuit of travel. We know that this can be very challenging, but what we have seen in general is a vacuum of information. Information is not available. So these are areas that needs to be identified and maybe uh, taken more seriously so that people can actually have the information readily available. That is very key. Also, we need to look at um, QC, uh, quality checks on the diagnostic centers, on the test centers, because how do you determine that they're actually doing the right thing? Thank you. Um, uh, th thank you very much. So the vacuum in information, we've actually been discussing this, and you're quite right, because we have provided um, a request to all the airlines to make sure that the links are available when people buy tickets to Nigeria. Uh, we've also linked up with the embassies to provide additional information to the embassies. But uh, moving forward, uh, we do have quite an active uh, media, uh, media team. Uh, we will link up with the Nigeria Diaspora Commission so that we can make sure that the necessary information goes to you guys and can be decimate, uh, um, um, disseminated. Um, I think the Google search engine for the portal isn't brilliant. Ideally, it should come up with a genuine site straight away. But as I said, a lot of people are trying to duplicate the site because there's payment involved, and maybe that's why um, it's not as visible. Uh, but certainly, uh, from our own side, we have we have put in a lot of energy, um, particularly working with the private sector. Uh, this is primarily uh, a joint initiative with the private sector. As I said, if it was just the public sector, we we probably would still be struggling to open the airport. But we we very much. Um, appreciate the challenges that Nigerians are going through when when they are coming in. Travel in itself is stressful. It certainly is stressful to me. Talk less of having to 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 fill a form electronically, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and put in payment. But the message I want to put out is: it's not necessarily the payment that we get really um, concerned about. It's this inability for people to move from a hard copy to an electronic format when the rest of the world are doing so. And it has to happen in Nigeria. And that's why I keep on saying the portal has come to exist. And we need to get familiar with it. And if there are issues, we need to know those issues early so that we can sort it out. Um, the, the private sector have been really, really helpful in this regard. Um, we have made a lot of changes since we started. And I'm pleased to say 85% is a, is a large number of people being able to come in and uh, pay, et cetera. But, um, the PTF has a lot of other priorities in addition to travel, and we really want this to be sorted out as soon as possible so that we can concentrate on schools and uh, other issues that have been cropping up. The PTF will be rounding up at the end of December, so whatever we, we set up needs to be able to 
be sustained uh, moving forward without the PTF necessarily being involved. Um, so that will become the norm. Yes. That will yes. become the norm. So we yeah, absolutely, we, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Progress. Okay, before we move to Mr. Obed, two questions here. Um, when there are distress calls, what happens? Who who answers them? Is there adequate provision for distress calls? And then how frequent is the portal put to test or tested so as to ensure that it's always functional? Can you address those two questions while we now call Mr. Uh, uh, yes, so we actually have a, a technical team that is um, derived from uh, the private sector that are working on the portal 24-7, um, dealing with the issues as they crop up. And as I said, we've also set up a, um, a sort of consumer a consumer, um, a customer support uh, center. For people arriving in Nigeria, there will be information leaflets that they will be given that goes through the system in terms of how to get tested, et cetera, and also who to contact if you have an issue. The, the gentleman, for instance, that came from Canada, if he had gotten in contact with the right person, whether it's somebody from the portal or from NCDC or from my team, it would have been sorted straight away. In fact, the, the day the viral video went out, that same day he was, um, he, he was refunded his, his money. That same day, um, whereas it was taking him ages going round and round and round in circles. So uh, we, we have, that there's no IT system that doesn't start with, with difficulty. In fact, I think we did very well with this portal because we didn't even pilot it at the King. We had no time to pilot it. We, we had to just get it out because we wanted to open the airports. And uh, of course, the PTF is a committee. Um, it's not just me being convinced that this is the right thing to do. It's also me convincing the other members on the committee and everybody being on board that we have done whatever we can to mitigate the response. I, I remember Lagos State Government, when we were opening up, they sent us data. They sent us data on people who had come in with the previous system we had. There was a particular flight where 40% of the passengers, 40% were positive when we tested them. 40%, and they said, you cannot drag us back. We spent over 15 billion naira sorting out our COVID problems in, in Lagos. You cannot then be bringing, we can't be bringing in 100, 200 new cases every day into Lagos. The state government will not take it. The federal government will not take it. And therefore, we have to make sure whatever we put in place provides that, um, um, that um, confidence that things are being done to mitigate the risk uh, for the country. But we very much appreciate the difficulty people are going it's a difficulty that would eventually, even now as I speak, is being solved uh, to a large extent. It's really the minority of people that will have challenge. If it's a challenge of payment, it will be sorted. But there's no challenge at the moment in terms of the QR code. It's the barcode we really need people to work with. And we will be making it mandatory in the coming weeks. But we don't want to make it mandatory and we start having complaints that people are being denied boarding. So that's why we want the, uh, the diasporans to be aware of this and to take it as a, as a routine because it's something that will continue to be there for, for months to come until, until this COVID pandemic is over. And we don't know when it's going to be over, maybe a year, two years, who knows? Okay, Obed. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Sanya Leo, uh, the coordinator of uh, pres Presidential Task Force on COVID-19. And thank you, our Madam, Honorable Abike Dabiri, the Chairman and CEO of NITCOM. Uh, we're very appreciative of uh, having the opportunity to talk to the relevant authorities in a very short uh, notice. That's uh, really uh, the NITCOM living, it up, living up to his uh, expectation of uh, uh, coordinating um, uh, diaspora concerns to the relevant authorities in Nigeria. Yes, with the issue in discussion, the diaspora is not uh, really happy with the policy in discussion because uh, um, personally, I've not had uh, first-hand information, but uh, going through what has been written and uh, video clips on, uh, on, um, on the internet, it calls for a great concern that uh, the diaspora should uh, engage talk to the relevant authorities and know what this is all about. Um, so as of now, I'll have to speak at a, a high level because like I said earlier, I've not had, uh, I've not traveled, so I don't have the first hand information. Um, so um, as, as of now, 
I had plans to uh, come to Nigeria in December to bring back my son, uh, born and bred here in the U.S., but he is in Nigeria for his youth service. Uh, I had plans to do that, but I've not much had the courage to do that, just based on what uh, uh, I'm reading on the uh, on internet. Uh, for me, it's, it's discouraging. And the, the reason why I'm bringing my son into it is that, okay, my son is a complete American, but he's more Nigerian than most people. And, and he loves Nigeria, but if he's going to travel and come to the airport and, you know, have this experience over and over and over and things like that, you know, don't you think that they will be dis, uh, discouraged? Um, so I just want to talk on the behalf of the diaspora so that, you know, when these kind of policies are being made, to think inwards and see how is it going to affect the diaspora. Because in my opinion, Nigerian diaspora is very crucial to our economy, to our, to our well-being, to our socioeconomic well-being in Nigeria. I mean... Mr. Obed, Mr. Obed I, I, sorry. I think that is the essence of having this. And if you listen to Dr. Liu, he had actually tackled us. Since you didn't have the first time experience, but as chairman of uh, Naido Americas, I think you've spoken generally speaking. And he has also said, don't be afraid. Your son needs not be afraid. There are people who've had good experiences, some have had bad experiences, and that is why we're here. And I think he has explained all those issues. So I don't yeah, want to deviate from... No, I, 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 have, a, I have a last point. request. Uh, I have a last request, madam. My request is this from the diaspora. You know, going forward, when policies that, uh, you know, that diasporas are involved, how appropriate will it be that the appropriate authority gets with the diaspora to need come so that diaspora will be part of uh, formulating the implementation of such policies instead of us reacting as we are doing now. We are just being reactionary because we don't like what is happening. How in the future can the diaspora be integrated in, in such policy making? Because again, Nigerian diaspora is very crucial to our social economic well-being in Nigeria. Okay, your point is noted. Uh, yes. And uh, we, if, I may, if I may respond, can I respond quickly? Yes, mm. yes. So uh, thank you for your comments. Well, first of all, negative news makes news. Mm? If 99% of those using the portal are satisfied and 1% have a, a terrible experience, it's that 1% that you're going to hear of, okay? As I keep on saying, the majority of people don't have a problem with this portal. Of course, there are challenging issues for the minority, which we are in the process of sorting out. And to a large extent, we have. So, for instance, if you pay and you go to a lab and they don't have your records, which was what happened to the Canadian chap. Now you will get a transaction detail and the labs have been told to deal with you, take your samples and then sort out their system later on. So we are working on this. Secondly, the issue of diasporans. I can tell you, I'm a diasporan. I've been in the UK for 22 years. I have families that travel to and fro. I'm just as diasporan as any of you. The majority of the people working in my secretariat have links with, 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 uh, with the external world. They are not civil servants. So some of the decisions we take are decisions that as much reflect our need in the diaspora. I'll be back in the UK by Christmas. I live in the UK. So I understand your issues very well. I don't think we would have had a different situation if, if, uh, if um, the PDF had gone through to the diasporans and asked them, what do you think we should do? Because some of us have already been there and continue to be there anyway. We are aware of the challenges. We are working on this. And I, I think it's not everything, every video that you see that you should take as the gospel truth or say that uh, this is what is happening across the board. Thousands have come in, 27,000 we've cleared in the last four weeks. 27,000 people, 27,000 people that would not have come into Nigeria if we hadn't placed this system in, uh, uh, to be active. And I don't think, I really don't think there's an easier alternative to this. We have tried to accommodate the quarantine, to shorten yes. um, um, But certainly, um, there's very little, there's very little we could have done differently at this point in time to allow us, to allow us to open up quickly. But if the alternative is for people to, for is for people to continue to struggle to come in because our airports are closed, then that's the other alternative which we don't want because we all want to be able to travel freely. So. Uh, please let's um, 
continue to let's continue to to talk let's continue to converse but at the same time let's realize that it's not the entire portal that um, that is ineffective or non function and uh, we have received as many compliments as um, as um, complaints in fact more compliments than complaints over to you Abby. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll call on Mr. Wally, but in the meantime, somebody says, when will the PayPal option be functional? And then they want, us to, they want uh, more information from the missions. Now, we, wish, we will get the leaflet from you and share on our website and ensure we share to as many diaspora groups as possible. So that's a question for you, but you can take that after Mr. Wally. Then somebody here says, uh, Victoria says she had a first-hand experience and that she had no problem whatsoever. Why some said, you know, like just admitted with you that maybe a percentage have problems. Now, Mr. Wale, I know you were very vocal about this. <laughs> Over to Allah, Wale. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sonia and you for the presentation. And uh, Honorable Abukenda Bri in particular, uh, from always being proactive, not reactional. I am a typical example of uh, passing message across to you and swiftly you've been taking care of them and most especially uh, taking care of our concern at this critical period, bringing this close to the people. Uh, my name is Olawali Uditoye. Uh, I'm the coordinator of Legacy Initiative International CIC UK here. Yeah? Uh, I must say uh, more grace to your elbow. The only thing I would like to add, Dr. Aliu, if you could add to the customer service portal the question and answer, it, which would be a kind of interactive between uh, whoever that wants to use it rather than making calls, please. Otherwise, you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Mr. Uh -huh. Wally, somebody just said you should ask your question and stop praising it. Sing it. <laughs> but we enjoy the praises. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, can, if, I, if I may, if I may. Uh, can I can, can I can I comment? So uh, the paper the PayPal there were issues with the PayPal um, uh, that was why it's still not up yet. And in addition to PayPal, we are also looking at other uh, payment portals to make it easier for people to use international uh, cards. Um, and we we have a meeting with the technical uh, committee tomorrow evening. Um, I think the the advice regarding the interactive question and answer maybe what we should have on the portal actually is is. Um, it's a system that allows people to type in their comments, just like we are having here, and we have somebody getting back to them uh, with answers to their query, um, um, rather than uh, having just uh, telephone numbers, um, et cetera. Uh, we do have an email that goes to NCDC, and I know it's a major part of their job every day to answer the emails, but maybe if it's public facing, it will allow people to see the the answers to the questions that they may have as well. And uh, the questions and answers that I have gone through today, I'll make sure that it goes onto the travel portal so that uh, people have access access to it. We already have a section with information. Over to you, Abby King. Okay, um, also, it's also being suggested that you should put a chat, a chat. Okay, that's what you're saying, okay. Yeah, that's okay. what I mean, yeah, chat box, which, yeah. Which I think is very, very, very fine. Okay, Honorable Tara, can you, Let's go through the questions you have. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Doctor, and thank you everyone um, for this um, very important uh, interaction session, interactive session. Um, I think most of the questions are uh, the, the the ones that are key have been answered, but I think there is one that I find particularly important, um, uh, maybe from the scientific point of view. Uh, what are the prob probabilities that passengers will be infected in flight, despite all the COVID-19 protocols established um, at both ends? Because it does appear that people have already um, been tested and they've been certified to be negative. Uh, and that is the assumption that everybody that boards the plane is assumed to be negative. Are there possibilities that people get to be infected on board the flight? Yes. So, um, as I said, with infection control, you cannot eliminate risk altogether. You can only mitigate it. Um, and that's the reason why we keep on harping on the 72-hour validity. As close as possible, you have your test. 
the more likely it is to reflect your infect infectiousness status uh, when you board the flight. So for instance, if you look at the incubation period for COVID, it's between two days to 14 days. But most people, it's a bell-shaped curve. Most people will become symptomatic around day seven. So if you were to catch COVID, or if I was to catch COVID uh, um, rather than you, um, I will become symptomatic in seven days, about seven days from now. So if I did the test um, more than, um, uh, if I did the test uh, much, much earlier, it's, the likelihood is it will be negative, but I'll go into the plane infectious. And that's why it, it, it goes beyond just the airlines looking at the test result you have, but also looking at you, whether are you coughing, do you have a fever, do you have um, respiratory symptoms, et cetera, and making sure that they don't board people. The biggest risk to me is really those on long haul flights. And it's been shown, um, there have been studies that have shown clear transmission to passengers, but especially long haul flights where people take off their masks in order to eat, and they converse with each other. You're sitting close to somebody who is infectious, coughing and spluttering, and almost certainly you could, you could catch it. But overall, the risk is really low. Generally speaking, travelers, passengers are considered to be low risk when it comes to transmission because most of them would have been, the moment you are screened and you're tested, and at the same time, you, you, uh, you don't have symptoms, etc., you're less likely to be infectious because it's not the entire period uh, of COVID that you have that you'll be infectious. It's usually two days before the onset of symptoms and up to three days after. And uh, beyond that, your infectivity status really drops significantly. Uh, but overall, what I would say is people should be, they should be comfortable that uh, the aviation industry is doing a lot to prevent transmission. And I think most of the things that they have put in place, because the testing before boarding the push for testing before boarding is actually being done mostly by the airline. If it was us in Nigeria, we could have put in place um, um, infrastructure to test on arrival at the airport rather than uh, asking people to test before boarding. But the advantage of testing before boarding is at least you have cleared all those that could potentially have COVID that would have entered the cabin and also stopped them from arriving in Nigeria. So in other words, you've already got rid of the majority of those with issues and you're only dealing with the, with the less likely ones. But overall, okay. I don't think, I, I, travel, I travel frequently and um, uh, to be honest, I'm not too worried, provided I use my mask, I gel my hands and um, I observe all those um, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions that we always advise, uh, you, sh you should be okay, you should be okay. Okay, the concern largely um, is from the point of view of cost um, for travelers. Um, having this test on both on both sides, um, uh, of course, some are suggesting um, why not um, the federal government, especially uh, it, it may not have uh, crossed your minds, but especially with regards to Nigerians who are in the diaspora, that these um, private uh, laboratories um, is not that they shouldn't conduct the test, but the cost should somewhat be hugely or highly subsidized based on, from the thinking of people, the resources that are available so that they can actually subsidize this cost for our own diasporas, um, wherever they are taking this cost. Because what is, what is important here is that their data is captured at the airport. They have the QR code, which means it is certified that they actually came into the country through a particular um, airport and they've passed through certain screens, so which means their data is available. Um, this reduces the possibility of uh, fraud or whatever in that regard. But the issue is they do this test at huge cost, um, maybe from the UK or in, in any other country, and then by the time they land here, they are now made to do the same thing. Let me put a follow up to that. Um, already, uh, okay. the chairman uh, uh, Nikom has already raised this issue, but I think it's very, very important. I will re re it. The responses to distress calls. Um, what happened previously, of course, especially with regards to the viral video, is this issue of responses to distress calls. And I must really say that the complaints in that regard is the major issue about the kind of how professional it is to respond to people who make the calls. And then how effective it is to respond to the um, issues that are raised itself. And then let me just totally up, up, up all together. Then um, we've talked about how frequent the portal is being put to us, but that, that's not the issue. 
The issue is that where the portal fails, what are the backup mechanisms that will ensure that the person who wants to be served um, gets alternatives without necessarily having to insist or waiting on the portal? Because we all know that most of these portals technically have load-bearing capacities. So at the time one is trying to log in, probably there are issues about um, space or data or storage capacities that cannot accommodate additional uh, people from, from getting into the portal. And then in case there are issues, because there, there are sometimes problems where the portal itself may have technical malfunction and it may not actually be understood until much later. I'm talking, uh, I'm, 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 I'm saying this because of my background in that field. So I believe um, there should be alternatives or backup mechanisms where the portal fails. Is there any such mechanism put in place? Because effectively, the major problem we, are, we can now see is, of course, like you've rightly pointed out, 90, 99% could be successful. But where communication is not effectively put in place, one, to mitigate and to provide effective communication to people in case there are such malfunctions. And then two, when the communication is not adequate enough, then all these problems will come up. Thank you. Uh, so, okay. so thank you. Um, a very specific uh, comment. Uh, Abike, can I quickly answer them? Mm. Okay. Uh, so uh, I will start with the uh, with more controversial one, the issue of uh, whether um, government should subsidize. So the, the main reason why we can't, as I said earlier on, it's really the number of passengers we get into Nigeria. Uh, it's nothing compared to Ghana or other countries. As I said, we get between five to 7,000 passengers when we fully open the airport every day for testing for, uh, that, um, that come into the country and a slightly smaller number that, um, that go out. Um, the tests that we do, um, at the moment we've done just over half a million tests. Um, the tests are very expensive. We all know public um, the PCR tests are very expensive even in uh, Nigeria and the developing countries set up, they are expensive. At any point in time, we probably have maybe 300, 400,000 test kits available. The majority of these test kits are donated by our donors. Uh, we have some that we have bought. Um, we are in the process of buying about another half a million or so. But if we were to take up the travel testing, we would run out of test kits in no time, believe me, because we will be tripling the number of tests we are doing every day. It is not sustainable. And even in developed countries like the UK, for instance, yes, you do testing and it's free under the NHS, but it's not for travel purposes. The moment you say travel, they would ask you to go private. Uh, we've had colleagues that have paid 250 pounds for a test in, in the UK before coming in from the private sector. We are trying to push the cost of PCR as much as we can down for, for the private laboratories. But one of the things that we have said to the private labs is they will not be allowed to double dip. They cannot serve the public sector and also serve the travel. They have to do it only within the travel sector side. And the more laboratories we have coming onto the portal, the easier it will be to push down the cost. And we will push down the cost. I'm very confident that eventually the cost will, will, will come down. But at the moment, it's, remember, if, if, unless we open up properly, even the cost of the tickets themselves will continue to be expensive. At the moment, KLM is not flying. Lufthansa is not flying. Air France are not flying. They are not flying because of issues related around the COVID pandemic, etc. So even the cost of the tickets themselves will be quite expensive and will be over and above any cost that you will be charged uh, for coming into Nigeria to have a COVID test at day seven which at the moment is about 100, it's less than $100. Um, uh, on average, um, Lagos is the only one charging 50000 The rest are all charging between 30, 36000 to 39000 And it will continue to come down. So less than $100 uh, per thing. And even Lagos, I'm very confident that uh, we'll be able at some point to bring it down. So yes, we would love to subsidize, but I'm afraid it's not sustainable. Even for the public health side, we're just about to test corpus, 85,000 of them. We are having to look for the test kits in order to do this massive exercise. We cannot divert these um, precious um, kits to, to, to travelers in a situation where we are getting up to 5,000 people coming in every day. It's impossible. And then if we do it for those that are coming into the country, we have to do it for free for those that are going out. 
So uh, I'm afraid it's, it's a non-starter for the country. Uh, it's not affordable, and it's certainly something that we could have done for a few weeks or uh, a month or two, but we cannot do it for a long, longer period of time. In terms of the backup mechanism, I just wanted to say, when we started off the issue of the QR code, so when people finish with the portal, they are supposed to get an email of the QR code back. And we realized that those with Yahoo accounts, Yahoo was spamming the return email. So all those with Yahoo accounts were having difficulty getting their QR code. We then designed a system where you go in, as you finish everything, you click a button and the QR code pops up on your screen and straight away you print it. So that's one of the backup mechanisms we've had. Since then, we've also included a system that where you have a completely different um, email um, um, HTTP, where you go in afterwards and you type it in, it's safer portals, and it takes you to a different site where you can generate your barcode if you are having difficulty with the main travel portal. So we do have a backup, but as I said, we didn't even have time to trial this the portal. We had to just open up, and um, we are improving things as we go along. In terms of response to distress calls, absolutely right. Um, that's why we're setting up the customer service center. Um, uh, um, dealing with customers, it's important that we try as much as possible to, uh, to, uh, for the labs to understand that the customers are their main. They need to provide a good service. And for labs that are not providing a good service, we will penalize them. There's a lab already in Lagos that has come off the portal. There's another lab that we has been having most of the complaints that we get, maybe because they deal with most of the passengers that come into the country, and we're working very closely with them. And if we are unable to resolve the issues, we will ask them to come off the portal. There are implications for people who misbehave, and uh, I will please ask if, if there are issues with either forgery or, or illegal acts, just let us know, and we will take action straight away. Uh, these labs, we can penalize them. If they are not on the portal, they cannot do b travel, travel business at all. So there are ways around this. And in terms of addressing the quality assurance side, all the labs that are on the portal undergo the NCDC quality assurance uh, process. We are also going to um, standardize the laboratory uh, results for those that are leaving the country so that it will be standard and there will be something on the certificate that will be, uh, make it very clear um, that um, it hasn't been forged uh, because uh, we, we see forgery not only in Nigeria but also in passengers that, that are coming from outside. Uh, but uh, we do appreciate the challenges. It's not easy setting up a, a system, an IT system. Um, IT systems are not perfect in the same way that humans are not perfect either. And uh, I think um, the, more, the more we can um, work together to resolve some of these um, issues, the better, because we, I really, we really need from the PTF side to move on and start um, um, addressing other parts of the response, not just the international travel side. Thank you very much. Before we call on Mr. Tony Sima, uh, Bobo Lukoya says we should do a 90 seconds video stating the processes. We can work with, uh, with you on that. And uh, somebody, people want to know, I think you've mentioned when all the airports will be open. For instance, Potakot International Airport is traveling there. So I hand over to Mr. Isima, your quick comments, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Abike, and uh, hello, uh, Sunny. Hey, how are you, sir? Good to see you. Nice uh, to see you. I just have a short comment. And uh, first off is to commend the work uh, that uh, the country and the PTF has, has done so far. And uh, it's tough. It's a tough one in our, in our environment. But there seems to be uh, some lag on leadership in the, the health and medical community. The voices are not there, uh, not coming out to support uh, uh, the activities of the of the tax force, also the essence of uh, fighting or holding on, containing the COVID. Uh, generally, it looks like we've, uh, the country has relaxed in so many ways, even in adhering to the basic uh, uh, preventative uh, recommendations. And uh, given the plethora of uh, disinformation uh, that has overwhelmed the world, uh, it's 
increasingly more dangerous uh, given what we're seeing and even responses of uh, uh, people that should know better. But even when I speak to even people in health, uh, the tendency is to play down uh, the impact of the of the COVID or the presence of COVID. It's already there. We have to live with it. That's what all of us are doing, learning to live with it. And uh, there's every need, one, to use the opportunity to, again, because part of the, it's primarily a health and a public health issue and crisis. And it's an opportunity to leverage and build on what we have. Uh, we can't, what we have is what we have. But then we have to now at least recognize uh, our shortfalls and work to build on them. Uh, the labs we have, uh, we, uh, you've mentioned the quality control aspect of it. How much is the organized uh, uh, scientific uh, lab community uh, working with you in that aspect? Because that's part of the ethical elements that uh, make people to conform. Uh, so I, uh, it would be nice to see, uh, use the opportunity to want to, again, enhance uh, uh, health and science issues, involve more of uh, uh, our university system and the Academy of Science, and particularly the, the organized medicine. They have to help. They have to speak up. I don't know how much integrated you are with them. And there's an organized uh, uh, hospital system or hospital organization association in Nigeria. And uh, more people go to those hospitals and to decide clinics. Uh, there ought to be some level of visible uh, integration with the activities. Uh, that's uh, an element uh, that. Then we also need to, with the tax force on, in hand, but please, this is very, very important. We have to be able to task ourselves to get a, a vaccine pl production platform. Uh, we did that in the past, in the yellow fever days, that created the Yaba, the Yaba lab. So that, that platform needs to, be, needs to be resurrected. And uh, I think a tax force, uh, I know the government uh, through the central bank is already, has already done something, but there has to be some, something specific. You know, let the government charge the charge the scientific community to uh, with the with the manufacturers to give us a platform, so we can continue to just wait for donors to supply us. So at least uh, we've uh, we've met some of their needs in counter. You know, in the counter payments, we've been able to correct. You know, which you did through uh, in your former effort. Uh, so we need to we need such challenges, and the tax force uh, is really in a good position to do that, working with the scientific community, so that we don't lose this chance. We don't lose this chance of, uh, you know, reviving some of some of the stuff we have on ground. It's just to revive them. Thank you very much, and thanks for the effort and what you're doing. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. I think. Um, we we, we, we basically touch on all the questions. Somebody is asking, um, what was it I looked at him? Yes, so. When will, when will uh, can you have these private laboratories at the airport? And then when yes. will, oh, okay. is there a plan okay. to have them at the airport? And then when will this move to every state of the Federation? So that, so that when yes. you travel to Lagos, you can get your test done in other states. Uh, indeed. So, so even now, if you if you arrive Lagos or Abuja, you're still allowed to go to your place of residence, uh, provided you have paid. It's the onus. The onus is on the private lab to make sure that your sample is collected, because all we need is sample collection. As I said, we have we we uh, we're just about putting up six additional states now on the portal. Um, and what we said to the private labs that are currently working with us, there are eleven in Lagos, uh, about seven in um, in uh, Abuja. Uh, we've just opened one in Kanu, is that we want them to open up sample collection centers across all the 36 states. And it's not difficult because all you need is a sample, somebody who can take a sample. 
and it could as well be just an individual and they they pay him maybe 500 naira per person and that person will collect the sample put it uh, um, pack it and post it to wherever the lab is so um, we're going to give them a time frame to do this if they do not open up sample collection centers we will penalize them by taking away we've given we've accommodated about 4000 naira i think also of their charges to to deal with the logistics of having to have passengers outside abuja and if they do not open the sample collection centers we will we will drop the the current um, uh, charges um, they are having to to that respect um there were a few issues that i wanted to quickly go through so okay you you asked a very good question why are we not testing at the airport so as i explained if you do a test very close to the point of departure it will reflect your result when you arrive in nigeria if you test if i test somebody who has done a test very close to the point of departure within 72 hours and i test him on arrival if he's incubating COVID, the likelihood is we will only pick about seven percent less than 10 percent of those that are incubating it's too early to test at the airport so there's no benefit of doing testing at the airport if you have a pre-boarding test it's onerous it's it to be exploitative it would be unnecessary it doesn't give you additional yield however if you do not test pre-boarding yes you can do a test on arrival but the airlines are the ones that are also pushing that they want their passengers to be non-infectious so they prefer passengers clean passengers boarding the flight and i understand that too because if let's say out of 10 two would have been infectious they come over to nigeria those two would have been excluded right from the beginning they wouldn't even be allowed to board because they have a positive result so so that's why the, the second thing is even if we were to do testing at the airport on arrival we, you will still need to do it at day seven onwards because there will be people who would be incubating so that means you will still need at least a two a two test method to be very certain for countries that can enforce isolation and that's that's what i keep on saying it's the issue is enforcing self-isolation if we can enforce self-isolation then you don't need to do that second test because you come in you have a negative test you stay away from everybody for 14 days you're fine end of story we're not interested in testing but unfortunately we don't have that luxury Abiki. and we know from the results we have that three about 3.4 percent of those that come in with negative results will zero convert and become positive and if you are looking at 5,000 to 7,000 passengers, that's a huge number. It's a huge number. It's up to 150 to 200 persons every day. And the Lagos at the moment, they are recording 20 to 30 new cases every day. You bring in 200, uh, 200 positives for them. You, do you think they will sit down and accept it? No, they wouldn't. And then it becomes an issue of should we close the airports? And I'm sure none of us would want the airports to close again. So, so that's why we're, we're, we're taking the decisions that we are. Um, one of the things that um, Tony mentioned is uh, the, our relationship with the academic community and also the diaspora. And a lot of people don't realize we have a large technical team that uh, work behind us within the PTF. And, and to me, this is the first time that people in the diaspora have actually influenced major policy decisions in government. And, and that's why some of the decisions we continue to take at, uh, uh, sound and very much reflect what is going on in the international community. Some of our policies are no different to what you will find in the UK. Even the UK, they were looking at doing a second, a second testing and reducing their quarantine period. But because they had a lot of elderly people, Saj decided not to do that. But the very same team that are advising the UK government are the very same team that uh, also advises um, from a technical aspect um, in the PTF um, in terms of uh, decisions to do with, uh, with the sign. Um, there was a question about when will Port Harcourt, Inugu open? So it, it's one of the reasons why we're trying to open up more and more sample collection centers. We're very keen that the airports start operating. They've lost a lot of money. Um, and unless we can get them to become fully operational, there will be job losses. So, so uh, we are working on that as soon as we have enough um, uh, sample collection centers across the country and we are confident that we have enough capacity for the labs to test, we will open up uh, Port Harcourt, Inugu and Kano. Uh, I'm sure it will be in the coming weeks, but, but very soon. Um, in terms of, um, there was a question about deportees. Yes, we have exempted certain groups from payment. Diplomats, because we, we, we had to. Uh, people below, children below the age of 10 do not need, do not need testing. You shouldn't, you shouldn't pay. 
And if you do mistakenly, please let us know and we will refund you your money. Deportees, um, girls that um, uh, have been trafficked, etc. Uh, anybody who did not pay for his ticket, another state paid for his or her ticket to bring them to Nigeria, they will not be subjected to payment for the test. We will test them under the public health uh, laboratory system. Um, and I've addressed the issue of uh, having tests, and yes, all state capitals have been testing. Thank you. Over to you, Abike. I think we've actually addressed all the issues. And um, if there are any more questions, please send to us uh, admin at midcom.gov.ng. We will answer your questions through the PTF. And then we'll also work with you in terms of um, maybe the video Bobo Lukoya suggested, the 90 mm -hmm. seconds video. They will use all our platforms. And people have said this has been very informative from comments here. They want it uploaded on several social media platforms, which we will do working with the PTF. Thank you very much. I think on that note, I will um, call on Habibat. Let's have a woman give a photo of thanks. And then somebody says, those traveling from Nigeria, must they do the test before they leave? Maybe you just answer that. Is it compulsory? Yes. So, so no. So in fact, that's uh, something that we are very keen to put out. It's the responsibility of the passenger to find out the country you're traveling to. Do they need a test? If they don't need a test, don't waste your money. If you're going to the UK, you don't need a test. So find out from the embassy, find out from the airline. If you do not need a test when you're exiting Nigeria, you don't have to. You don't have to because they have other systems for, for um, making sure that they are safe. Okay. So thank you. I'll call on Adiza to give a formal vote of thanks, but our Nidcom staff here are saying that the video will be available on Nidcom website on all our social media platforms. So that will be our contribution to information sharing. So thank you very much, Habiba, um, your final... Um, Hello, good afternoon. And afternoon. I, I'm Habiba Teluame from Nidcom. I want to say that I really enjoyed this program. I want to say thank you to the hosts, Honorable Abika Dabri Erewa, the Chairman CEO of NEEDCOM, Alias Mamada Spora. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Sani Aliu for all his explanations and responses to the questions. We've seen that all hands have been on deck working hard to ensure that Nigeria is safe. I want to thank you, Mr. Obinna, for, and your technical crew for putting all this together. We want to say that um, a lot has been going on except for the video clip that went viral. And just one single video clip wants to negate all efforts put together by PTF and government. But I'm happy that Dr. Sani had responded to all the questions and and I please want the diaspora to know that they are always welcome home because that man said he will not come to Nigeria again. So please he will understand the problem that caused his own problem. And I'm happy with the customer care center that will attend to people the chat system, the email, so that if they don't pick up their calls, at least they can respond to emails. So we want to say thank you very much for this uh, program. And I want to say thank you, Mama Diaspora. You are always there to listen to all diaspora and even the Nigerian citizen. I want to say thank you very, very much. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank see you, you all. Yeah. For those questions coming on the chat, those who say you want to reach us, I've given you the email admin at midcom.gov.ng. Mm. Don't send us your email. I will, will take all the feedback on board. Once again, thank you, Dr. Aliu, and thank you, everybody, for participating. See you again thank you. at Travel Home. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Abike. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Mm. Thank you very much.